Eight o'clock. Oliver Wainde is our guest this hour, um, and we're looking at Constitution 2010. What it means in 2024, Ken? Um, Olive, good to see you. I know we've had a lot of discussions about the Constitution, and you sit at a very unique place. Uh, you have to study and understand the Constitution, and then you have to use your knowledge to impact Kenyans um, using your organization. I'm looking at the Constitution 14 years later, and uh, most parts have been litigated, and we have understood the Constitution because of the several constitutional applications that have been made in court. But my understanding, there's still parts that have not been tested or even straight. But I wish to know this morning, from where you sit, that unique place, do you think it's time that Kenyans rethought this Constitution? Uh, it is difficult to rethink something that you're not even implemented because that's, the, that's precisely where the challenge is. Um, there's been that school of thought that uh, probably we need to rethink about the constitution. Uh, but there's also another school of thought that uh, asks, why do we have to even rethink about changing something that we've not even implemented? Uh, and, and that is the big dilemma we have, Ken. Um, my suggestion is that we just need a full throttle approach in implementing this constitution. Uh, we cannot fault something that has not been uh, fully implemented. I mean, there are basic things, for example, like uh, this constitution. I mean, the very essence of it, of course, was the defense of the minority, you know, talking about the minority, uh, the people, people living with disabilities. These people are still where they were, probably worse than 2010. When you talk about the, the two-third uh, gender rule that was proposed way back, now I, I do understand the gymnastics around it and why it's difficult to achieve it. Mm -hmm. But that is precisely what we need to discuss as a country. How, what can we do to get this parity that was suggested in the constitution? We cannot just talk about, oh, let's just shelve it like it was being discussed uh, here some time back uh, because uh, democracy is democracy we have to go further. Remember, the constitution is made for Kenyans. It's not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And so it is important that this constitution address the aspirations of Kenyan people. When we talked about two-thirds, there was a reason for the framers to, to say that. When we talk about the defense for the people, I, I mean, for people uh, living with, with the disability, uh, you know, generally in the minority, there was a reason for that. And it is incumbent upon us as a generation, to ensure that that is implemented. Now, the escapist uh, would then say, no, 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 this is too much. 14 years that down the line, we ought to change this uh, because this is not working. Uh, now, um, it is true because, you know, constitution is not frozen in time because it has to evolve mm. with the ebbs and flows of life. And therefore, uh, one way or the other, we still need to... Uh, work on areas that we think need to be worked on. Mm -hmm. That is not in question. But what is in question is the wholehearted approach in implementing this constitution. And not, in, not only implementing it, but actually living it. Remember, uh, you as a lawyer, you are aware that, that there is this uh, famous judge, Antonin, who said even ba banana republics have constitutions and have got <laughs> bills of right. The bigger problem is how do you leave it out? Mm. So we have a big problem of having something written and something implemented and lived and internalized by Kenyans. So let's not talk about uh, rethinking. Re rethinking anything. Yeah. Let's just have the right people, right mindset, and right architecture and right ecosystem mm -hmm. to actually implement this constitution. Mm -hmm. This constitution is extremely good. Uh, I am not a lawyer. You are, but I can tell you as a non lawyer that if you go through all the 18 uh, articles that we have, this is probably the best constitution that this country can ever get. Mm. Okay, so yesterday we had a whole conversation about Shadow Five here. So if you missed it, you might just want to catch it from YouTube. But uh, uh, this constitution has also, just speaking from where you've left, been touted as the most progressive, and you've just said it, it's one of the best constitutions. The problem is in the taste. 
it's the implementation of this constitution. And we can increasingly see how Kenyans have become aware, thanks to organizations like yours and others that have made it a point to educate Kenyans, and uh, thanks to lawyers who've often gone to court, Okia Mutata, for interpretations for public interest. They've often gone to court. There's a lot of awareness to this. Now, when this constitution, just before the promulgation, I remember I was also in Naivasha, I was just a rookie, just joined journalism. I used to make all those trips to Great Rift and the rest. Um, it was said to be a negotiated document. And 30% could have been bad, 70% could have been good. Now, on the point of being a progressive document, from where you sit, having tried and tested this, who is the weakest link in the implementation, having spoken about the implementation being the problem? Who could be the weakest link? Is it the judiciary? Is it uh, the enablers of the constitution, the subsidiary legislations from parliament? Is it the Wanainchi and their interest in their constitution? Who, who is the weakest? Is it the politicians who negotiated for their benefits? Because they said, you know, sometimes you want to put something in there that you think benefits you. But then suddenly things turn around and you realize you're no longer where it benefits. Now you're on the receiving end. So who would that be? Well... Who that be, I will answer, but I will start by first of all excluding Wananchi because Wananchi are not part and parcel of this. They are the victims of this thing not getting implemented. So who has not part, uh, done his part in terms of implementing this constitution? Uh, I would say that uh, uh, probably the executive carries the biggest responsibility. Mm. Uh, obviously because we have people uh, in this uh, executive who are obviously against this constitution, that notwithstanding anyway. Uh, the actual implementation of uh, this constitution, if it got the support it did uh, that, that it required from the executive, would be much more easier. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, use examples that we've seen recently things that are obviously out of this constitution. For example, I mean, what has just happened right now uh, between uh, the merger of, the merger, quote unquote, uh, between the ODM and uh, the ruling party, that alone is killing the spirit of multipartism, which is part and parcel of uh, what we talk, uh, we talk about in terms of representation, and which is very explicit in our constitution. That only happened because the executive wanted it. Uh, and it's, it, but, it, but Article 38 explicitly also gives you the right to associate with whoever you want to. Mm -hmm. It's in the Constitution. Yes, absolutely. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Because the executive has got almost veto power. They can access that better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. So I am saying that uh, the fact that they've got this power, it, it is therefore important for them to actually exercise it in, with much more humility. Mm -hmm to uphold this constitution, which, that, uh, which has not happened. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's not everything that you do uh, that is right. It, uh, th everything that you do rightly is necessarily doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And that is what ought to happen. So I feel that uh, the executive uh, on paper uh, really mean good for, uh, for this constitution. But in practice, uh, we've had uh, to have a lot of question marks in terms of their uh, commitment to implementing this, mm -hmm. and so you've seen the it. biggest load. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And because parliament. we are in a presidential and, and, and parliament, what about parliament? Because a lot of enablers of this constitution should have come from parliament. Yeah. Yes, but you you see, uh, and I'm sorry to say this, that uh, that is why uh, even the assumption that parliament is an appendage of the executive is exa exactly that, because you have seen, for example, the the finance bill that we had that became an act and that caused all mayhem in, in, in our country emanated from the parliament. But it did so on the behest of uh, the executive. So I am saying that our parliament is almost important, but the importance has been well um, uh, brought about by the executive's uh, interference of the same. Okay. And that's what I'm saying, that it is important for the executive to take, a, uh, you know, to, to have a relook on itself, okay. on what it can do about this, and, and to let each and every part of the four, uh, uh, of the three arms of government to be independent. So far, it's not. If you look at it, um, maybe with a little bit more scrutiny, why would any executive, doesn't matter where you are in the world, 
why wouldn't you want to implement or why wouldn't you want to foster a uh, an environment whereby a supreme law would be implemented because if you look at how it came about kenyans around the country contributed to this and it was what would make sense for everyone so why would you be against the implementation of the same thing that would be put in place to safeguard kenyans yes uh, and that's the uh, that's a very good question but but remember and that's why i talked about uh, at the beginning of people uh who are used to the to the status quo the status quo in our country and in our continent and in our generation has a lot of benefits you can acquire land anywhere you can you, you, you can literally rob our country of any amount of money that you want from mm. the exchequer you can i mean you can do anything with that power so when you've got an enlightened population then it becomes a problem for you and i'm not saying that's the case in our case i'm just giving a hypothetical situation mm -hmm. when you've got a, a, an empowered people then it becomes a problem for you to retain your your your, your status quo mm -hmm and the related benefit and by the way uh, uh, this is not new in our even uh, this uh, women empowerment which we as a, a sector and as an organization is really trying to propagate is causing a lot of issues with with the uh, boy child and um, with, with the male people outside there because that's in that we are trying to incite their their wives but you forget that when you've got a wife who is empowered, mm -hmm. it is best for you, it's best for the family, it's best for the community. But for those who fear and who have had this power, which is generational, then have a problem trying to relate to that. That when you've got a, a people that initially depended on, on you in terms of decision, in terms of their destiny being shaped, depended on you, now all of a sudden want that to be owned by themselves, it's not very pl uh, 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 pleasant for them. And they will fight mm. and this is not beginning with our generation it's not beginning with our executive right now it has been a long almost human uh, uh, history long uh, challenge for people who are in power to let go yeah but let go it will happen because a time is going to come one of us was Swahili kuwa wengi wape usipo wapo mm. and we really don't want to get there mm. there's a reason why framers sat down and got us these 18 articles and it is incumbent upon you to actually implement it now if you don't want i mean if there is a problem with it and that's what george washington said in the american constitution that they will make it very hard for it to be uh, amended but if amendment ought to happen then it has to be people driven and not elite driven like we've seen with bbi and like we saw with nadco we really don't want that mm. we want a situation where this thing belongs to kenyans it doesn't belong to the politicians it doesn't belong to the lawyers it doesn't belong to the pastors this document belongs to the 54 million kenyans that were there on 27th day of august 2020, uh, 2010 that are here today that will be here long after we are all gone and it's important for us that we are able to bequeath the next generation of a document that we found and held in sacred and actually handed it over to them mm. as it is right now that is not the case and we don't we can't allow that as an uh, as a sector as a generation as a leadership of this uh, organization you know what i find interesting you know we keep talking about tinkering with the constitution perhaps even if if if, if the leaders or the political leadership were serious about the constitution and the benefit that the citizenry can derive from it I want to dare suggest that perhaps they should rejig the commission of the implementation of the constitution again because that was well, this is a pet subject of mine anyway the because if you don't have a commission we have a commission for everything in this country except the most important thing and the thing that we are forever grappling with we had this discussion yesterday up until the time when we know that the constitution has been operationalized because that is the fight isn't it how do you interpret this what does this mean and we are over, and we are forever going to the supreme court with these things here if any executive any government was serious we would get a commission that actually deals singularly and solely with the constitution and how it is that it should be implemented 
Because so long as we have that in limbo, then it means that the power structures that have existed in the past will continue dominating. Because mm -hmm. with the constitution that we have, we still have a situation where those in power behave as though we don't have a new constitution. They actually do exactly what they want. They will disregard court orders. Clean. They will go against the constitution. Again, clean for you to work in broad... It's not at night, in broad daylight. And the problem is, one doesn't see the consequences that should follow. Now, but if indeed we understood all the tenets that deal with the constitution and the implementation of the very aspects that minutely specify what would happen in the event of the abrogation of the said constitution very many people would be very reluctant to try and go against it right <clears throat> but as things stand now it's open season the court pronounces itself those in power say simply ignore the courts it's it, not it even seems like there needs to be a tightening of screws you know in certain areas i mean again coming off a couple of conversations that we've had recently and to say that look if truly that the bank or you know the i want security that has been set up to ensure that this happens were actually tightened then people would be almost forced to live within the tenets of the constitution but it seems as though it's free for all you can exactly you can do whatever you want there are no consequences there are no consequences at least there are consequences Absolutely. there's a supreme law but there's you no know, supremacy that's being supremacy that's being put in it you know 60 years ago uh, or more than 60 years ago, Martin Luther King was talking about uh, the U.S. Constitution, and he said that uh, uh, there were three enemies to that Constitution. And uh, the more you look at it, and the more you interrogate the statements, the more you, you literally uh, uh, see our situation in what he said in the 50s. Uh, he talked about uh, the enemies of the Constitution then being racism, economic exploitation and militarism and that's what we're seeing here now we don't have racism but we've got negative ethnicity we've got economic exploitation and we've got milit militarism and you can see it here that uh, uh, the oligarchs those those who are in power uh, would use these three to actually uh, perpetuate uh, the the threat to our constitution uh, when you talk about negative ethnicity and you've seen it uh where uh for example the the very nature the very base of our constitution was about mm -hmm. protecting the minorities and you've seen how much um we still have kids in uh, turkana in in northeastern who are still going to to school under tree you know almost 65 years after our independence right we have seen 400 out of every hundred thousand uh, kids born die we have seen teachers still going to strike every two or three years because they're not paid uh, you know and that is uh, uh, you know collectively uh, a big challenge to the implementation and the internalization and the living of this new constitution mm. then the economic ex exploitation and you've seen it now over the past uh, uh, few weeks and you we also it in the country where they collect a lot of money and they use it to uh, literally buy uh, the loyalty of people across the country uh, and therefore that would not be possible if people were economically empowered so the less empowered the, pop the population is the better it is to control using resources and militarism we've all seen it um where uh, you go out uh, doing what is actually prescribed uh in the constitution and you literally get killed yeah yes i mean in one year we've lost close to 300 people in the streets mm -hmm. and the worst part is that we, we don't even know how many exactly we've lost um and these are not just statistics these are people's husbands people's wives brothers and sisters and we we're just moving on as a country as if it's no big deal and so i'm saying that uh the normalcy with which we've taken uh, our challenges um is baffling and uh, should not be accepted right yeah. what do you see <clears throat> Excuse me, if you were to look into a proverbial crystal ball i mean and i guess you take it's a sum of everything that has happened over the last 14 years what would you see moving forward in terms of, because I mean, many have touted it as a, it's a good constitution. 
you yourself have said it. There are many things there that are fantastic in terms of the development of the Kenyan people. It's sovereignty and, you know, all of this statesmanship. What would you say would look like in the near future with all these ingredients that we see right now, you know, non-compliance, goodwill or not? Well, I would use the biblical analogy of going up to the mountain top and looking across the land there, and it's a beautiful land. From the top, I can see a beautiful land called Kenya. Nothing gives me more hope than seeing our young people, including our sons and daughters, asking for what is their right. Mm. That gives me a lot of hope. When you see Gen Zs uh, doing what, that, what they did, I don't advocate for violence, I don't advocate for uh, law lawlessness, but it gives me a lot of pleasure when I see people saying, this is our country and we'll do everything else to make it better. Mm. That gives me a lot of hope. I'm also seeing a lot of hope seeing more and more people getting elected and getting into, uh, into areas of influence. I, I desire to see a country where a generation is going to come that uh, will not look like, my, uh, like uh, Martin Luther King said, mm. uh, where you came from, but indeed the content of your character. I'm seeing hope. I'm seeing a generation that will come and, uh, and, and implement this, this constitution. And not only implement it, mm -hmm. but leave it. I am seeing a situation when, and remember, when we, when we talk about the future, we are not just necessarily talking about uh, uh, the, the constitution in exclusion. Right. We are looking at, uh, at it as the bedrock of what we want to do, the economics, the politics, the, the social structures. And that is what, therefore, we come in to do as Uraia. Mm -hmm. Because one thing that we've realized is that everybody seems to be knowing the constitution. The problem is how to live it. Yes. And, and that is why our emphasis now going forward now becomes Utu. Mm. Utu has become the key word that we, we want to permit this country with. We want to, uh, you know, knock every door, talk about Utu. And Utu is as biblical, is as Quran, is as Veda as it goes. Because it all goes as, do unto others what you want to be to done, done unto, unto you. you. Yeah. And love thy neighbor as you love thyself. You know, if we only implemented that, then there will be no need for this constitution. Remember, they said, I think it is, uh, there is a, a, a I, I think it was George Washington who said that if angels lived in this world, then we would not need uh, any constitution. And if angels ruled over this world, then we would not need constitution either. He said George, that, George Washington. I think it's George Washington. <laughs> we, we assume he had seen some <coughs> angels. Right? Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but but generally what what it what it means is that we are living in this world and apart from things getting written in a constitution mm. it's how i relate to you i don't need anything in the constitution to respect you as a human being right i don't need anything to be written not to steal his phone or your phone or your phone exactly so there are things that are written right but i think it's just common sense it's just a decorum requirement that we live like human beings ought to live. And that's why we are now saying, beyond the constitution, mm. how do we make people just be good to one another? How do we make people to live as human beings? And what? therefore, Utu is becoming the catchphrase that we are, we are saying. Yeah. It's originating from the word Ubuntu. Yeah. That, okay, let, let's forget about everything written. Can we just be good to one another? And just treat each other right? Absolutely. Fantastic way to end on this morning. It is Katiba Day. 14 years after the promulgation of the Constitution 2010. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but that there's also something that we can do one to another in terms of humanity. Oliver Waindi is the Executive Director of Uraya Trust. He's been our guest this hour. More conversations to be had. But thank you for being in the hot seat this morning until we talk again. Good morning. It's 8 a.m.